the fifth champion in UFC heavyweight history, a two-time NCAA Division I wrestling champion, the 2004 knockout and upset winner of the year, and oh, the wrestler of the century at Ohio State University. Kevin Randleman is a man who's experienced many heights, but experienced even greater lows. Every accomplishment of his was seemingly followed by a setback, extreme adversity, bad luck, or honestly, a combination of the three. Most people may remember Kevin for sporting one of the worst stab infections in history. Like honestly, probably history. I, I won't show the picture, but I'll link it down below. Go check for yourself. But many people won't know that Kevin has had 15 plus surgeries, has been in a coma, and almost died in a car accident, on top of many other things. Today, we're going to take a look and deep dive into the life and career of Kevin the Monster Randleman and see how a young, skinny, nerdy, small kid was able to send one of the greatest heavyweights of all time into the Shadow Realm. Kevin Christopher Randleman was born August 10th, 1971 in Sandusky, Ohio. He was one in a family of 13 who had little money to say the least. This often led Kevin to roaming around the streets and getting up to no good. From countless fights to even getting shot and stabbed at one point. Yeah, listen, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know how true that is. I read that in an article that Kevin was actually quoted as saying so, but I spent hours, okay, maybe not hours, but definitely a good amount of time researching that exact point and found nothing to back it up. So I don't know, take that with a grain of salt, maybe, or five. Either way, this would definitely begin to shape Kevin into the tough, determined and chippy guy that he was throughout his life. However, it wouldn't be until about 12 to 13 years old when he really began to juice. Oh no, sorry, sorry, wrong line there. Began to wrestle. At about that age, it would be when his older brother would actually introduce him to the sport for the very first time. Throughout high school, Kevin would continue to follow in his older brother's footsteps in wrestling, but would also compete at a very high level in both football and track and field earning a starting spot on the lineup on the football team four years in a row and actually qualifying for the state finals in track and field for his discipline, which I honestly have no clue what it is, couldn't find it out, so sorry. <laughs> Either way, this was definitely a testament to his athleticism, which shined most on the wrestling mats. This would be where Kevin would sport a record of 122 and 11 and top it all off with, oh, what's that? Oh, just a state championship, no big deal in Ohio of all places. <laughs> Either way, this, along with his supreme jumping abilities and massive frame at the time of 5'10", 180 pounds, would prove to be enough for Ohio State to offer him a position on their team. And Kevin accepted. In his first year at Ohio, Kevin would not only win the Big Ten tournament, you know, become an All-American, no big deal, get silver at the NCAA championships, but would most importantly 
the thing that would trump all those accomplishments, meet his local provider and juice supplier, Mark the Hammered Coleman. <laughs> okay, I, I'm afraid to God Mark never sees this because holy, I'd be dead. Either way, Mark was actually the wrestling coach for his first year at Ohio State, the same year that Kevin was a freshman. The two got off to a rocky start to say the least. Well, rocky for Kevin, to be honest. You see, for the first three months that the two were on the team together, they said not much, if at all, to each other. It wouldn't be until a random workout out of the blue where Mark would pull Kevin aside and ask him if he wanted juice. Okay, no. He asked him if he wanted to work out, okay? And Kevin hesitantly agreed. You see, he previously thought that Mark was actually a racist and hated his guts and was even planning on quitting the team because of it. However, after the workout, he rushed home, called his mom, and told her he's for sure quitting now. That man's a racist. Okay, no. He called her and said he wasn't quitting and loved the team. This would be the beginning of a newfound friendship that would last for years, and they wouldn't even miss a workout for years to come as well. Anyways, during his second year at Ohio, he was able to do even better than he did in his first. And I know what you're thinking, oh wow man, one of the best athletes of his generation was able to do even better with more training, more time, and got better, blah 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 blah. Okay. I get it, but imagine this, this is the equivalent, okay? Imagine you go to the dentist's office and there's only five people waiting in line in front of you, okay? And then the very next day, you go to the DNV to renew your five year long expired license and there's only two people in line. Yeah, those kind of rare once in a lifetime occurrences, all right? Anyways, he was able to sport a perfect record for the entire year and you know what that means? He became the NCAA Division I champion. Yeah, pretty crazy. However, keep in mind that this was all within only the first two years of his wrestling college career. He had already reached the peak. Where else was there to go? Well, I'll tell you where, and that's definitely not down. Kevin brought one of those foldable camping chairs, a tent and some firewood, and set up shop at the very tippity top of that mountain and won another NCAA gold medal in his third year. And that's after getting his jaw dislocated and a wired shut before the finals. Yeah, crazy, right? Either way, in his fourth year, he was still at that very tippity top with his tent and chair still up there, but the fire had run out. AKA, the school didn't let him participate in the wrestling program because he didn't meet academic qualifications, blah, 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 blah. Like a good one, Ohio State. Let's not let the Michael Jordan of wrestling wrestle because he fell, failed some Here's spelling test. Like, yeah, nice decision. Spell Despite all red. of this, he was still looked at as one of the best collegiate wrestlers of all time and would even win wrestler of the century at Ohio State University. Like congrats, you won an award that pretty much nobody else in history at your school has ever won and will win for a long, long time. But no, 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 you still weren't good enough to participate in your senior year. Like get one Ohio State, like come on guys. Either way, after his tenure at Ohio concluded, he would be woefully welcomed into the Hammer House with open arms. And so would begin Kevin the Monster Randleman, Randleman's journey into MMA. In 1996, Mark would, no, 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 not that Mark, guys. No, no, not that one either. Oh yeah, there we go. That Mark, yeah, yeah. That Mark was able to get Kevin a spot in Universal Valley Tudo fighting. And if you don't know what Valley Tudo means, it basically translates to directly anything goes. And when they say anything in Brazil, they definitely mean it. On top of this, 
fighters didn't wear any gloves during the fights and would often fight multiple times within the hour or the second hour of a night. Either way, Kevin would participate in a tournament and in his debut would fight three fights and finish all three of them in the very first round and leave victorious in the Valley Tudo tournament. Ah, you didn't catch it, did ya? You see, every single fight for the organization was actually one round. One long 20 minute round at that. Don't know why I'm mentioning it, but yeah. So technically every fight was finished in the first round. So yeah, he won his very first tournament and would even go on to the finals of his next tournament only to lose via an extremely, and I mean extremely questionable stoppage in overtime to Carlos Barato. And when I mean questionable, I mean like Robbie Lawler versus Ben Askren-esque. Like you could argue that Kevin went limp and, and, and I might buy that just like Robbie, but I mean, come on, the man shot right up after and Mark Coleman was definitely not happy to say the least. Either way, shortly after, Kevin would participate in one more tournament in Brazil in which he would lose in the finals once again. But I mean, how bad could it be? After the fight, he would be making his debut in the Tomato House where his career would really begin to take off. On March 5th, 1999, Kevin the Monster Randleman would step in the octagon for the very first time. Across him, he would see a two-time UFC heavyweight champion and the man who put a stop to his coach's title reign. It was Maurice Smith. And Kevin was not messing around and would go on to win the fight via decision after one very long 15 minute round. Uh, you gotta love it, you, you just gotta love it. Kevin Randleman came in here, he was a confident warrior, and he's giving the toss him. After this massive win, Kevin would see himself matched up against the pancreas kink, his future best friend, and wedding attendee, El Huapo. The fight was extremely close. Some people had Boss winning on their scorecards, some people had Kevin, but we all know Reyes won rounds one, two, and three. <laughs> okay, either way, Boss in the end was able to edge out the split decision victory and obtain the then vacant heavyweight strap. Either way, after the loss, Boss would actually vacate the title in hopes of becoming the first ever fighter to become a champion in two separate weight classes. This meant that there was an opportunity for Kevin to fight for the now vacant heavyweight strap once again. However, this time, he wasn't walking out of that cage empty-handed. Instead, he would defeat Pete Williams via decision and become the fifth champion in UFC heavyweight history. This man's been behind me ever since I was 19 year old punk. And every time I win something, this man's right behind me. And would even go on to defend his belt against Pedro Hizzo at UFC 26. Shortly after, at UFC 28, Kevin would unfortunately lose his belt to Randy via TKO. He would then move down to light heavyweight in hopes of challenging for a title there. However, some guy named the Iceman had other things in mind. This guy actually brought out a hose and extinguished every last ember of Kevin's flaming hot fire and left him knocked out at UFC 31. This led to Kevin's last fight in the UFC where he was actually able to pick up a nice victory before making his debut in Pride. Kevin would then go on to make his debut in the most famous organization in the world, at, okay, fighting organization of course, in the world at the time, Bare Knuckle FC. Okay, I, I already said it earlier, so I don't know why I made that joke, but he made his debut in Pride of course. In the organization, he was able to actually pick up three quick wins in the span of only three months, from November 2002 
until December of 2002, he would go from debut to 3-0 for the organization. And actually, in the third fight against Ninja Hua, he had the most significant moment in his entire career, as per Kevin, of course. Leading up to the Hua fight, Kevin had claimed to have finally learned how to relax. You see, prior to this, he would get extremely anxious, stressed out, the whole nine yards, running laps, working out, and would gas out before the fight even started. However, this time it was different. And I'm not, I'm not making this up, okay? I'll probably even attach a clip here because it's so unbelievable, okay? Before the Hua fight, he legit brought a pillow and blanket to the fight and napped before fight time. And even after being told two hours before he needed to make the walk, he responded with, wake me up in an hour. Needless to say, this was the first time his mindset changed and it would change forever and pay dividends in every fight remaining in his career. However, after his unfortunate loss to Rampage, awful, awful stoppage by the way, apparently the referee smelled like alcohol and cigarettes for goodness sakes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, anyways, it would be a few months after this loss when Kevin would have his first life-changing and near-death experience. Yes, I said first near-death experience. He was driving in his SUV when all of a sudden he had a seizure. Before he knew it, he was completely underneath a truck, like an 18-wheeler, with his hood a couple inches away from his neck, nearly decapitating him. Somehow, through all this, Kevin was able to awake the monster within him, go green, get angry, pull on his superhuman strength, and lift the engine that was laying on top of him in order to free him from the wreck. This left him with needing to get 180 stitches in his head and 50 in his forearm for having to lift the engine. The police officer said I had to be doing 120 because I, I seized up or whatever, boom, hit a truck. The truck slammed on its brakes. My car got turned around because there was a guy right behind me watching it. Like, it was like, holy crap, dude. I can't believe you walked out that. But tore my car up, ripped the engine up. Uh, my hood of my car came right through the cab, just cut everything like butter. Whoosh, came, hit me right in the head here. And when it hit me here, it bent the hood of my car, but it grooved this all out. So I had 180-some uh, stitches in this head. And when I was in the car, I, I, I woke up in the car and I was like, I thought I was dreaming because there was this fat guy outside and I thought he was running with me. And I'm like, oh, man, this is a crazy dream. And then there was his brother, there was this black guy out there. And he was like, you know, I, I just kept looking over, looking over. Then they broke my back window because my car, it pushed me. My SUV got compact like a Toyota car. So my engine kind of got threw up into the car on top of me, pushed me back into my back, like my hatchback and that. The guy cracked my window, and it kind of woke me up. And when I woke up, I, I looked out the window, and I grabbed him and pulled him in. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? He was like, don't worry, bro. We're going to get you out. You're going to be safe. As soon as he said that, I went. I looked back, and there was this big-ass semi right, like, this far from me. Fuck! Not like this. Please do not let me go like this. I'm supposed to, I mean, I think I'm going to die. And when I die, I'm going to die saving someone. Needless to say, he was walking out of that wreck with a massive hole, well, hole like gash or chunk of his dome missing from his head, would only spend 12 hours in the hospital and would go on to fight Sakuraba only three months after. Mm -hmm. 
After the incident, Kevin would go on to win only three of his next 13 fights. However, within those, he had some of the most significant and most career-defining moments within those fights. With the most notable of them all being the ones we recognize most, we love him for the slam and the upset. A 9-1-2 fighter at the time, Mirko Krokop entered the Heavyweight Pride Grand Prix as a heavy, heavy favorite. And to put it into context, in their rematch a couple years later, Krokop was still a minus 380 and Randleman a plus 320. So you could only imagine what the odds were for their first fight. Needless to say, Kevin would go out there in the first fight and shock the world with a vicious left hook and some of the most ferocious ground and pound I'd have ever seen, or have ever seen at that, and finish the fight. And yeah, speechless to be honest after that. For all the fans, Japanese, Croatian, Russian, American, I just want to say God bless all of you. の方はいいですか。皆さん、ファンの皆様、みんなが日本人であっても、クロアチア人であっても、ヨシア人であっても、そしてアメリカ人であっても、皆様に神のご加護がありますように、そして世界平和と皆さんのもとに愛が届くよう
Oh my goodness. You think that's bad? Well, you must have not heard what happened in Brazil. You see, three months before he contracted staff for the very first time, well, first time, before he contracted staff, he was in Brazil and was diagnosed with a disease called Kangikomiosis. Kaki. Kokotomy. Kok I'm done. Okay? Figure it out for yourself, all right? Either way, it's a disease that's contracted by inhaling fungi seeds. And it wasn't too bad, okay? All it was was he had a pound of fungus growing on his lungs that caused him to collapse and put him into his very first coma. So yeah, remember when I mentioned that Kevin faced some adversity, setbacks, and some bad luck? Well, maybe you can now see I wasn't kidding whatsoever. Anyways, despite all of this madness, in which, by the way, I personally would have quit super shortly after that brutal car accident, let alone having a pound of fungus growing on your lungs. I'd be flipping burgers before I even knew it with a smile on my face. Well, I don't know about a smile, but I'd definitely be doing something else. Well, I guess that's also why I'm here in my parents' basement and Kevin's in the Hall of Fame. Well, anyways, Kevin kept fighting like he does. And after the Shogun fight, the Nevada Athletic Commission actually came out and said that the urine sample that Kevin provided wasn't even real urine, but instead, apple juice. Okay, maybe the second part wasn't confirmed, but hey, I wouldn't be surprised. Either way, whether it was apple juice, horse piss, or even some alien concoction, alien concoction? I, listen, don't ask me, it's one morning. <laughs> Either way, Kevin was suspended for an entire year by the commission. He would later go on to say that he was terribly scared that he would fail the test because of all the tablets or pills he was taking as a result of all the surgeries he had over the years. And to be quite honest, who am I to say that he's not lying? In fact, I believe the guy. Well, okay, 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 hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Maybe I don't believe him exactly about the whole juicing thing, but I would have never in a million years said that to his face. Now for the sad part. Kevin unfortunately passed away on February 11th, 2016 at 34 years old. He had some complications due to pneumonia and it resulted in a heart failure and ultimately his passing. There was a huge outpour of love for him on social media and from people like Dana White, Mark Coleman of course, and many other fighters who also pressed the UFC to introduce him into the Hall of Fame. Uh, any memories you have of uh, Kevin? Dude, I had some great memories with Kevin. That guy was a, a ball of energy. I remember we had, uh, you know, we were at some rich dude's suite in Las Vegas at the uh, Mandalay Bay, I believe, and Randleman comes in and he looks at me. I can't remember who else was there. I think it was maybe Danny Castillo, uh, couple other guys and he goes he goes man I'll tell you what this sport is blowing up you all gonna be rich you're gonna be a millionaire 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 and then he goes can I borrow 50 bucks <laughs> it was so funny and then he proceeded to get in a wrestling match with the uh, uh, one of the DeSabato brothers from Ohio on the on the marble floor he was a wild man and, uh, and, and such a sweetheart, so I'm, I'm happy for him. In 2020, Kevin would be honored into the UFC Hall of Fame and honored for all of his contributions, wins, and achievements in the sport of MMA. Honestly, before we wrap things up, I really want to highlight some of these amazing stories that I uncovered as I searched through all this stuff about Kevin for making this video. From going to people's birthday parties, talking somebody out of suicide, 
to regularly having $700 plus dollar phone bills, Kevin was truly a man of the people. Let's kick it off with honestly one of the best fan stories I've ever heard and only came to light because the person shared it on Reddit. You see, this Redditor was in a dark, dark place in his life and was planning on taking his own life. He bought the rope, went into a house all alone, the whole shebang. Although before doing the act, he tweeted out saying goodbye to everybody, his friends and family, and sorry for what he was about to do. However, the monster regularly followed back all of his fans. Like I said, he was a man of the people. And he saw this tweet and instantly DM this Redditor. The guy was shook. Kevin the Monster Randleman, a UFC heavyweight champion, was in his DMs? He just couldn't resist. So he picked up his phone, answered, and what would you know? Kevin was asking for his phone number. So the two talked. They talked for hours and hours, and before he knew it, the monster had talked him out of committing suicide, and he even lived on to tell the story to us today. Well, not today, but he lived on to tell the story. Another amazing story about Kevin came from a Redditor once again. You see, as a kid, this guy was at his local baseball diamond and from a distance saw a black man with beautiful bleach blonde hair. I mean, who else could it be but his idol, the monster, of course. He approached the man with a big smile and just asked for a handshake. Well, Kevin, of course, went above and beyond, gave the kid a hug, and even asked the child and his parents if they want to hang out for a day and just see what it was like. Just, you know, regular people hanging out. So they agreed, had a great, had a great day together, and even exchanged phone numbers. Later on, a couple months passed, and the Redditor asked Kevin if he wanted to come over to his little brother's birthday party. And to his surprise, Kevin responded and agreed. He showed up at the party with a signed Kevin Randleman action figure to give to his little brother, talked a bunch of amazing stories with the family, laughed, and just had a good time. And that's honestly just a testament to how great of a man Kevin really was. And honestly, I'm not doing these stories any justice, so please, I'm going to link them in the description. So honestly, please go and check them out for yourself. So yeah. To wrap up, since this is honestly the longest video I've ever made, at, I mean, I have seven pages of script right here in front of me, but it's honestly been a complete and utter blast to do. Reading, writing, and researching about Kevin's life was truly inspirational. The man was the Ohio State University Wrestler of the Century, the UFC Heavyweight Champion, sported the Knockout and Upset of the Year in 2004, slammed Fedor on his head, but most importantly, was an amazing father to his four children and an all-around great guy. He always looked at adversity directly in his face and somehow always kept moving forward. And I, I know I never get this serious, but honestly, Kevin's life was like truly inspirational, and I really hope this video brings even the slightest if it does the slightest bit of justice to how great of a man Kevin really was. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.